Cause you took my scars, bruises and broken heart And numbed all the pain Show me how to heal And now I don't feel broken anymore Number one, Billboard pianist Paul Cardall Do you believe in miracles and second chances? Over a decade ago, I was raised from the dead. Read Paul's story, The Broken Miracle, by J.D. Netto. Visit thebrokenmiracle.com. This is the Paul Cardall Podcast. These are those he admires and wants to share with you. Please show your support by subscribing to the Paul Cardall Podcast. This is one of those scenarios where we see athletes in all kinds of sports. The athlete just collapses, and everyone is like what's going on what's the injury we have no idea it ends up being hcm which is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy explain to us what that is me and bethany have it in and now actually our oldest brother has just presented it even though he's in his 30s so we feel very blessed to have each other but we've been on you know the journey together but though it's the same condition it has looked completely different in both of us Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is basically where your left ventricle wall in your heart is abnormally thick. So especially when your heart starts beating extremely, extremely fast, that left ventricle wall is so thick that the blood flow can't get into the heart. So suddenly your heart, basically the walls are just collapsing in on each other and it's now stuck and no blood is now in your heart, which then sends you into sudden cardiac arrest. Scary. Yes, super scary. And to know, um, you know, our condition, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, is the number one killer of student athletes. And most often, the first symptom is death. We're sisters. And since HCM is um, a genetic condition, that's how we both have it. But we also come from a big family. There's nine kids of us. Did your mom or dad have this? An aunt, an uncle? Do you know? Because this is relatively one of those things that's um, people are more and more aware of this. So did you have family members that besides your brother? So what ended up actually happening is um, my mom's sister. So our aunt, um, she ended up going to a doctor's appointment. And while she was there, she was um, complaining of some symptoms and they said, Oh, well that makes sense because of your hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And she basically looked at the doctors like what? And they're like, yeah, you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. She was in her fifties at the time. And so she has no kids of her own. And she immediately calls my mom and she did some research. She found out it's genetic. She calls my mom and she's like, Hey, you got to go get the kids checked. And my mom's like, okay. So my mom calls, but to get any type of pediatric cardiologist appointment with no symptoms, it took about six months. And through you know, I feel um, God and like kind of like leading my mom's hand. She chose Hannah for that first appointment. And then Hannah goes to the appointment and the doctors basically, a Dr. Moss looked at Hannah and basically was like, how have you not died yet? Because Hannah was very active at the time doing dance and basketball. And so my mom goes, hey, I need like eight more doctor's appointments. And they're like, yeah, in six months. And my mom was like, no, 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 no. It's happening now. And so one week later, I go in um, with me, two other brothers and our other sister um, go in. And I also get diagnosed at the time. And then our mom also has um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But as we were talking about, the thing with HCM is it, it presents itself so differently. So Hannah probably has it the most severe than me. And then our mom and like our brother now have like a more like mild case of it and such. But that's kind of how we found out. If not, um, who knows what would have happened and if we would have ever found out. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know, but is this considered a can a congenital defect that just shows up later yeah they consider it um part of like chd congenital heart defect um but yeah the the thing with it is is like we found out later in life even though 
when we found out what the symptoms are of HCM, Hannah and I looked back and we're like, we had all of those symptoms when we were growing up. But unfortunately, it's like, I think it's 65% of the time, your normal pediatrician kind of just dismisses them as like normal things for kids that age to go through, which I don't think is, you know, totally correct. But that's basically what happens. So yeah, it is part of the family since you are born with it and it's a defect of the heart. So both of you knowing, you know, in your diagnosis that you had this, was this before you got into athletics or was this after? Six months prior to being diagnosed, I was the most active I had ever been in my life playing, you know, not only on a basketball team for my school, but I was playing on a YMCA co-ed team outside of school. And then I was dancing outside of school, not only dancing in school, like I was completely beaten. Like I was like, yeah, yeah, so active. And then honestly, by the the grace of God, right before, so I got diagnosed literally the first month in high school in 2013. Um, And I go and I kind of was like, you know what? I'm not going to go to a school where I study dance. I'm going to take a break and I'm going to hold off on kind of which sports I want to do. Did that make it just a little bit, you know, not as hurtful when they told me everything that I had done my whole life, I couldn't do anymore right then and there. Yes, a little teeny bit, because I can only imagine if I was actively on a sports team, if I was actively on a competition team for dance, how hard it would be to explain, oh, I was fine, you know, last week. And all of a sudden, one doctor's appointment, I'm told I can't even get my heart rate up. I can't watch scary movies, like anything that is going to, you know, adrenaline based, you cannot do. And that completely changed my whole world because I grew up being so active and then thinking, wow, like, what can I do with HCM? A lot of it is manageable through lifestyle changes. So you have to change your life in order to survive. Um, But it definitely completely changed it and changed my whole trajectory of like, what am I going to do with my life now that most of the things I thought I could do are no longer an issue if I want to be alive and stay alive. Yeah, these things definitely put into perspective kind of a reality of our mortality. You know, we recognize how fragile life is. And even myself, growing up with a single ventricle, I couldn't do the same type of things, you know, sports. But I I couldn't do it because, not because my heart was going to, you know, increase. I just didn't have the energy. So it was like, I know this is silly, but I, I went to high school in the 80s. And so it's like when we'd go to prom... I would only look forward to the slow dances for two reasons, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, it's like, I can't get out there and I can't do what I want to do, what everybody else is doing. I can't do the moonwalk, any of that stuff. No running man, just, uh, you know, stick to my guns. But uh, yeah, I mean, that fear of exercising and passing out. So you both were diagnosed with this. It happened later in life when you learned that you had these heart issues. I'm totally curious, Bethany, what is the medication that is prescribed to people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? For me, um, it's a little quick insert. So when I got diagnosed, I actually had just dropped out of high school. I got accepted um, to dance pre-professionally with Miami City Ballet. So I was going to be six days a week, eight hours plus a day. I was going to be homeschooled. I was like on cloud nine. I was like, oh my gosh, this is like dream come true. So one week into the program, I got diagnosed. Um, The doctors realized how much dance means to me. And through this journey, I remember like when Hannah got diagnosed, that whole week leading up to my appointment, I kept praying like, please, God, I don't want it. I don't want HCM, please. And you could just feel it like I was going to have it. So what happened with me is because Hannah's was so extremely severe, they had to stop. But they put me on um, a beta blocker called Natalol and they would just monitor me. So I was on Natalol for the time and the dosage ended up going up. But I hate that medicine. Sorry, just so everybody knows. <laughs> but but beta blockers is the is the most common medication to be given to HCM patients. It's because it just lowers your blood pressure. Um, I mean they're working on and something thins the blood more your heart, but yeah, and, and thins your blood a little bit. But it's mostly a, a variety from uh, anything that ends in lol <laughs> is the is the medication you you take um, from it. So then it's all you know, as you know, and 
people who take minutes, like the little things of, oh, that's not working. Okay, what if we change it? Or, or let's add both of them and see if that does anything to fix it or not. You familiar with quinidine? Mm -mm. No. It, it helps with arrhythmias. Mm. So it's specific to people that have irregular heart rates um, that fluctuate. So, you know, um, there's sinus rhythm. And then, you know, if your heart skips a beat, it's called flutter. That's why people associate it with broken hearts and romance. And then you have fibrillation. And when you go into fibrillation, and this is something related to um, HCM, is you have to be cardioverted, you know. And this is what you're doing. This is you're getting defibrillators into public places because you never know who's going to need defibrillators. My question to you, have either of you ever experienced a defibrillator? Yes. So we both um, are very familiar with the cardioverter defibrillator. So we both have implanted ones. We both have um, okay. automatic um, implantable cardioverter defibrillators. Um, we do have different manufacturers in that sometimes a point of contention. <laughs> um, you know, which one is better or whatnot. Um, but mine, I have a Medtronic one. Um, and it was a year after I got diagnosed, um, which is why we're big on screening kids like every two years, because right, like all of a sudden it really presented itself at this age thing. But my heart, because it's HM just with the thickness was about 22 millimeters, which is double the amount it should be. And then a year later, it was up to 28, 29. It had substantially grew. And because of that, I qualified, you know, woo, won the prize to get a defibrillator implanted because now I was even at higher risk for arrhythmias. You know, I was having VTAC. And then so they implanted a defibrillator and thank God. And even my doctor said, thank God, because six months after I got it implanted, I went into sudden cardiac arrest in my sleep. And if it were for not for my defibrillator, I would have been dead which is sad that I know from the headlines that even a few people my age have died in their sleep because, you know, they either were dismissed by the pediatrician, nothing wrong, or again, HCM is very considered asymptomatic that you don't know until you're dead. So I was very extremely grateful for my defibrillator. It also very much dismissed the feeling of walking on eggshells that I felt after I got diagnosed, like saying, don't run, don't do anything. And I felt like, oh my gosh, if I do anything that gets my heart rate up, I could go into sudden cardiac arrest. So knowing that I had my personal defibrillator, that I didn't have to rely on somebody else to know how to use it, where it was. Um, so very much that story of being saved by a personal one is really what geared in the story behind our legislation, behind our advocacy um, of knowing, like they told me one person in my school was qualified to use an AED. And that person was also the swim coach, the, the water polo coach, the lead teacher. He wasn't always at school. So I'm here hoping, okay, hopefully I don't drop, you know, into cardiac arrest when he's on a swim meet or anything. So we very much big advocates. But after I was shocked in 2015, a year and a half later, I'm on stage doing a lip sync contest and I get shocked again. Oh, geez. So, and I get shocked not once, but twice. So then I really knew because when I was sleeping, I was unconscious and deep sleep. So the shock wasn't powerful enough for me to wake up or to feel it. So when people would ask me, how does it feel? And you're like, I don't know. I was like, I, I was gone. Like, I don't, don't know what it felt like. And then on stage, um, which if you go on our Instagram, it's one of our, our pin posts. And I caught it on video, which was also a big teaching tool because you know, you don't record yourself usually when you're like, oh, I'm going to be shocked by, by my implanted defibrillator. Um, but because it was during a contest, people had their phones out and, and were filming it. Unbeknownst to many of the viewers, did they know what was happening? And even unbeknownst to me, I thought my friend had hit me really hard in the chest mm. twice. Mm. And then when I confronted her to be like, hey, like, man, you like really hit me hard. And she was like, I didn't touch you. And then when we watched the video, I realized, oh my gosh, I've been shocked by my defibrillator. And to me, I describe it as if somebody took like a sledgehammer and hit like a home run hit into your chest. Like it hurts. Like it's, there's no like sugarcoating it. Like it knocks the wind out of you. That's why people sometimes 
completely fall down to the ground or take a knee when it happens. Fortunately, all that dance training, I was able to keep my balance when it yeah. happened, yeah. but it really knocks the wind out of you. It does not hurt. It's not a long hurt. It's just a really as if someone took a bunch of electricity and singly put it, you know, right into your chest. So you can like I was able to drive home and be fine and and, you know, go on with my day. But it hurts really hard in the moment. People say like a horse kicking you in the chest and I would completely agree, you know. Mm -hmm. I've never been kicked by, but I would exactly probably that's the feeling like the wind completely knocked out of you. I remember in my own life, I had to get cardioverted three times. And because I was in fibrillation and they, in my case, they wanted to do this surgery called, well, it's a minor operation called oblation. Okay. So you know what I'm talking about? Because our hearts are electrical devices that keep us going. They, they are the heart. They are everything. You know, um, the whole world is going to be healed because of God whose heart was broken. And so the heart is, is fascinating, but it, it's such an electrical thing. So that if, if you go into these irregular rhythms, the, the problem is, is you could throw a clot your blood could thicken and then you have a stroke uh, causing who knows what. And um, so I was on all these blood thinners, but I had this irregular heartbeat. And they're like, we can't put a device inside your body because you don't have a, a, a right atrium. We can't, and you, your aorta is all messed up. So we can't thread it in. Uh, we, we can't just do that. We just have to shock you. So I was in the um, outpatient, ready to go in and get this done. And they thought they had put the medication in me so I wouldn't remember this. And they put the paddles on me. And it's, it's like 55,000 volts of electricity. And that's what they put into, I believe is what they put into people on death row in the electric chair. So I felt lightning surge right through me. And yes, you are correct. It, I mean, I had a similar experience where it felt like a horse kicked me, but there was like a rippling effect of, you know, just, just awful. So, oh my but, gosh. yeah, so I can totally relate, but, um, Bethany, you have a device in you as well. Is that scary? Yes. Um, well, the biggest thing for me with this device is knowing, so I got mine a few years later because I started having these like syncope episodes and for some reason I always happened in the bathroom and I was just collapsing with like, no, we didn't know why. Um, and knowing that the device saved Hannah's life, um, I almost felt like this like warm blanket like of safety over me kind of thing. Like now if something were to happen, like I'm going to be safe. Um, but I think the only scary part of it for me was, um, you can see it on the Instagram. I flaunt it now, but it's a pretty big device. It sticks out about one inch out of my side. Um, and, um, it protrudes. And the scariest part for me was what was everybody else around me going to think about me? Like, I thought people were going to think like you're deformed, you're ugly. What is that? And I've had all of that. Trust me, I've had it all, but what was I going to think of it? And I was really, really nervous. Um, that was the scariest part for me. And being a dancer and growing up, when you stare at yourself for like eight hours a day in front of a mirror, you judge every single part of your body. And that was me. Like I'm my hardest critic yeah. <laughs> was that aspect of it. <laughs> did you have, did you have people say anything to you that was unkind? Yeah, I've had, um, so I no longer can dance anymore because my heart has gotten worse. But like when I would wear leotards and such, I remember we were like at a party and, you know, everybody had a few drinks in them and um, some girl kind of came up to me and she's like, is now like an okay time to like ask you like, what's going on in there? Like, what is that thing that like sticks out? Like, what's, what is that? Like, what's wrong with you? And then I was like, oh, that's like my defibrillator, blah, blah. And this was before I had launched the Instagram page. And, you know, so people didn't really know. And I've had guys like, 
be in certain situations and they see it and they immediately are like weirded out and it's like oh my gosh like I feel like an alien (laughs) but yeah so I've been there but I also love the effect it now has because I totally embrace it I totally flaunt it I have pictures everywhere like showing it off um I've had unfortunately like during this process of legislation with Hannah um I've had people not want to pass our bill because I've taken photos showing my defibrillator and you know that weren't appropriate yeah it's crazy and this is coming from like other women and we're like women supporting women you know what I mean um but I think at the end of the day I have to remind myself of how many moms have messaged me and been like thank you so much for showing me that my daughter can still be beautiful and love her scars and I've had other young girls like one of our good friends from England now, she just did a really super cute, I know you have a photo shoot, she does super cute photos showing off her scar. And then um, I had another young friend, she got the same defibrillator as me and we're both like pretty tiny. And um, she was like, look at my defibrillator and she now embraces it. But like, we've all been through the same thing and it's just so sad, but unfortunately we don't, I don't think we really see heart conditions or young people with heart conditions in the media. And so it's trying to change that. And especially so all those other young people don't feel alone because it is, it is a sad world already. And imagine having something you didn't choose. And now the outside world is kind of, you know, inflicting what they think of you on, on, on you. Yeah. Two things I picked up on what you said was, well, first heart disease is the number one cause of death congenital heart disease is the number one cause of infant related deaths, but no, you can't see it. Uh, congenital heart disease is the least funded of all the major diseases. Now I have the utmost respect for organizations that fund. I can't even imagine having cancer, you know, or there's people that have, you know, spina bifida. Um, there's other things that, uh, you know, where you you can totally see what's going on. But people like us, we have to go to the swimming pool. And then they look at us like, I remember these <laughs> kids coming up to me at a water park when I was in college and they saw my chest and they couldn't stop staring. And I was, you know, it's not the reaction you want from kids. You want it from other types of people, <laughs> but it's, they're looking at you like you're a freak. And they're like, uh, I said, listen, kids. This is why you don't get into a gang. Get shot up. You got to get surgery. So lay off the drugs, kids. You know, kind of have to use humor to make your way through it because it, yeah, your feelings get hurt. Had a kid that used to call me raisin because I was blue and purple. And yeah, so those things, you know what I mean? Like, so I, I feel your pain. Yeah. Did you get some of that stuff? Did you get teased it's i like teasing in the way like if you can tell like humor yes it's very i'd rather you know laugh than than cry or do both sometimes but for me it was because this is a non-visible you know disability like i could i can't even take the stairs and such like that it was more that i felt you know i've just been sidelined but then i was being sidelined from every activity and no kid again it's not my choice they're telling me it's either life or death so it's not my choice but like even and what's the worst is like feeling it like the most like in church settings where they would do activities and i'd be like hey like i can't really do that oh well you can just come and watch and it's like um (laughs) that's not that enjoyable no offense i could stay at home and watch tv and you know do things that i like but like then it was like on me all the responsibility is on me to come up or, well, sorry, like you can't do the hike. So you don't get to participate in the party after the hike because, and it's like, and here we talk about in the setting of like, Hey, God gave me this trial. I, you know, I didn't choose this. I'm putting it through. So you would think that like you would do something that we all could do. And then I think I remember like after I got my surgery in the, in the, you know, pick you they're like hey like here's some certain things that you could come and do to other people with medical conditions and some of them were life-changing the aspect that like for instance there's serious fun camps there was a camp that i got to go to and the difference of a camp i went to where you know people were like yeah everybody 
where I felt completely, I was like, I don't even want to go. Like, what's the point? I, you know, that have no activities. And then at this camp, I'm doing zip lining. I'm doing all of this stuff that I'm told like, no, but they have the care. They have the things that I was like, I'm doing things I would never normally do, like sliding on hot fudge and doing crazy stuff and getting messy and just enjoying being a young kid yeah. because they gave me that freedom. But they also were prepared. Hey, if something happens here, we're watching you. And it was something different of having that community. And it's that kind of feeling that we wanted hard charge to have that feeling of, hey, come on, come in. We want you to feel like a young person because how many people like gaslight you of like, no, you're so young. OK, I know put an age on <laughs> on heart disease. Like you think I'm like joking with you like, yeah, no, got you. I don't have, you know, a heart condition. They're like, oh, but you're so young. How can that be? And you're like, again, because it's not in the media, because you've been told one thing, you know, where you think, oh, it has to be this certain age. Do you think I like relating to a bunch of old people like, oh, you have the device that my grandpa has, you know, when I'm telling my friends and you're like, but knowing like that's why we started it was to have a young community, you know, and a lot of like middle aged people end up coming to us because they're like, hey, like the old <laughs> yeah, we can't relate. We want to still be like, hey, we still have a, a great, active, as close to normal life that we can. And so it's very much all of that, like in the teasing or the little comments that people make that it's like, yes, you make them because you because it's not visible. Those are the emotions you go through um, relationships. Um, have you noticed how you can really start to see the character of the people that you interact with? You see who sees beyond, you know, the fear of what you have that may, oh, you know, maybe they'll, maybe they'll die on me. Maybe, you know, there's a worry about that, but there's also like, Ooh, that's gross. Have you, have you been able to weed out? the quality versus the quantity of people you have in your life? Well, I'm super grateful for like the heart church community and all of that, like those folks understand and stuff. Um, but definitely I think you're in situations, especially with like friendships or just hanging out with like people or whatever and certain things like, Oh my gosh, is your heart going to start beating really fast and I need to put like an AED on you. And you're like, Oh my gosh, like, no, I'm okay. And then, like Hannah was saying, like it's an invisible disability, so they don't see it. And then I think when we start to build new relationships, like I've seen with um, certain people, and then finally you find the time to start telling them, well, I do have this heart condition and blah, 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 or something happens and they see the device or whatever, and, and it comes out. I think sometimes I've noticed people take a step back and they start to just look at you like, like something's wrong with you and they don't want to be a part of that. And they don't want to put like, those, they don't want your problems on them. And then I think I try to do this job because I never want anybody to think like I'm a victim or that I can't do it. Like I try my hardest to like go out there full force with all my energy and like just take every day head on. And then I think people just then look at me like I'm weak and I'm unable and like, oh, she just can't keep up. And I think it's, it's really sad. And they like put you in a corner a lot. I've noticed. Um, so I think my, my group, like the people that are closest and understand is really, really small. I just made, um, a short film where it was focused on like the friendship. Cause for me, I've had more friendships and being diagnosed in high school. And for me in high school, it was like, oh, I'm the girl with the heart condition because I was like, I need to share my story because people my age are dying and nobody's talking about it. I kind of like when I went to college, I was like, I don't want that to be the first thing somebody knows about me because it's just human nature. Like you are going to perceive me differently when you realize I have, you know, a deadly heart condition. <laughs> like that's just normal. Like I'm not going to put it. But I think the struggle is like, I don't want you to look at me with pity like there's something about caring and there's something about babying me. But you know, you can play the heart card every now and then, <laughs> you know, you can use it. <laughs> oh yeah. I do sometimes though. Yeah. 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 Which I used it to get out of pioneer Trek. I love that. Which is a, a they basically uh, told me I couldn't do pioneer Trek with it. <laughs> it's an LDS. I had to go. It's an LDS faith tradition where, 
you dress up like pioneers, even though half the people don't have pioneer ancestors. You dress up like pioneers and you, like a bunch of polygamists and you walk across the desert and it has to be miserable and feel like, you know, there's something about the faith where you have to suffer to feel the spirit. So, which is not what God, God wants us to do. No. <laughs> and then you're putting, I had to, I, yeah, no, I had to go on it and this is, you know, Facebook was around, right? Not Instagram yet. And so people had taken photos and, you know, this is when they just t mass tag you. So I come back to school in the summer and everybody was like, oh, are you living on an Amish farm churning butter? And I was like, no, oh my gosh. No. Cause to be honest, like I didn't really talk like whatever, you know, you're raised in the church, but you know, once you hit an age, you kind of like start to feel and who you are and stuff. But this was during high school. So I go on the Pioneer Church with my brother. I was so embarrassed. I had to remove all of those, delete my Facebook. I was like, no, no. <laughs> yeah. You're wearing a bonnet. They've sold you off to Warren Jeffs. You know, you're trapped. You can't get out of it. You know, uh, you have no decision. It's a patriarchy. <laughs> anyway, it's, yeah, yeah. Every, I think every church, though, has their summer camps. And everybody can relate to doing something that's just strange. Uh, but it does build character. It builds friendship. Um, your website, getcharged.org, there's a lot of amazing things on there. So everybody go to getheartcharged.org. You have a very specific call to action and what needs to happen right now. And, uh, and then you've got the Heart Charged Act. And I'm seeing... So quick thing. So I actually work in politics. <clears throat> I worked for um, a state representative. Um, unfortunately, though, that bill uh, died. How you? It was really hard. I, I'm going to say when it was killed, um, I cried every night for about two weeks. Um, basically, what happened is um, you, when you have a legislation, you have the House side and the Senate side. Um, our House sponsor was the guy that I actually worked for. And then on the Senate side was one of his um, good friends. Unfortunately, though, on the Senate side, it died. Unfortunately, I think sometimes they just look at us like we're young little girls and we have no, we really don't know what we're talking about, but we promise we do. And we work really, really hard. So, um, yeah. So unfortunately the bill died because session is now over on Friday. Um, so the bill died for this time. So, but everybody please help us next time around. Yeah, this is in Florida, right? So yeah, this is in Florida. Right, Florida house bill 263. Um, yeah. You're trying to get defibrillators. And yeah. Yeah. I yeah. never heard it in those. So what you see our call to action is having it be on the committees. And we had a great number of people who we appreciate who did that call to action, who emailed the chairs of those committees. Um, but unfortunately, our sponsors got in the way and we're telling them to hold off because, yeah, the, because they didn't finish reading the bill, even though it was presented, you know, many months before. But, you know, politics is the whole thing. But we're fighters, you know, like you said, we're in the ring. So, yep, you know, get yeah. knocked down. But and we find we're, we find a new way to approach it. We're innovators, you know, think if it didn't work this way, what needs to be fixed? Yeah. And and like you were saying, the bill basically um, implemented AEDs within schools and it implemented um that everybody knew the warning signs and implemented drills because sudden cardiac arrest is the number one one killer on school campuses and unfortunately though in the mass media and the media tells a huge story it tells people what to do we think it is active shooters and unfortunately that is that is a whole nother problem that we do a great job of tackling and how we tackle it and such um but unfortunately when somebody dies of sudden cardiac arrest on a school it's one kid here in florida one kid in minnesota one kid you know, in California, it doesn't all happen at the same time. It doesn't get the media attention. So it's actually like 63 kids a day under the age of 18 die. And unfortunately, um, since nobody thinks of it like media, they really don't think that it's a problem because it hasn't happened to them or it hasn't happened. And they were like, the money, the cost. And it's like, this is somebody's life. Like, we're putting a price tag on somebody's life that you don't want to put these AEDs in the schools. And, you know, we had all the facts, like we can get them for $600. Like, we can afford it. I mean, in Florida, we have over a billion, billion with a B dollar budget. And we're talking about if every school in Florida got at least one AED, it was going to cost them about $200,000. That was it. That was it. 
and they just they can't wrap their minds around it. And it's it's heartbreaking, but we won't give up. <laughs> Bethany, you're in politics. Uh, let me run this past both of you. I spent yeah, I spent decades trying to figure out how to get some change with congenital heart disease. So, you know, and this all ties into this is that to get real change in legislation, we have moms go in to advocate. My son, my daughter didn't make it. It's not about that. It's about money and you have to follow the money. And I went to the, it's the cardiovascular trial committee. These are the most, these are the players in heart conditions. These are the people that come up with the defibrillators. They come up with surgical device. They own everything that the, uh, that people need who are dying and they, and the insurance companies cover. So it's this big like web of trying to know who's the players. Are you working with these device organizations? Are you, are you, do you know them? Do you know the leaders responsible for marketing them and selling them? So we know a few people that have um, maybe what you would call like third party selling the ADDs. I mean, we would love to be like in touch with like Medtronic and stuff, but we have a few plugs for like people that work for Zoll that do Zoll ADs. We have a huge plug for somebody who does like all types of AEDs and um, he's like rescue one and we work really well with him. And he was like, Hey, I'll give you guys a great price. He sent over pricing because he really wanted to see the legislation pass. And he was like, look, this is the pricing I'll give. It was amazing pricing and stuff. And, um, but those are the kind of people we know, of course, we're always trying to expand and stuff. Yeah. I'd keep, I'd keep tackling trying to get on the inside of these companies if they have events, whatever, um, put feelers out for, I mean, you guys know what you're doing and I don't mean to give you advice, but, um, just, no, please do. we're all on the same team trying to battle this. And yeah. And what happens is these companies, if they see where they can make a profit, they then go, unfortunately in our, <laughs> this is politics. They'll go and start relationships through the legislation, through the lobbyists in order to get mm -hmm. things and something like this wouldn't be a bill. This would be squeezed into a bigger bill. So nobody really knows that it's in there with the board of education. Yeah. Like what, what is this? Well, we passed this. So, um, and this company is going to provide it. And, um, the taxes from the, the property taxes of this state or however it's worked, they're going to fund it. So we're just taking a piece of the pie to solve this problem. I mean, it's this, battle and it's not emotional at all these people in washington dc we had people from france from ghana all over the world doctors trying to get their you know it's not emotional they're not emotional it's all analytical mm -hmm. you know so i feel your frustration but i believe you two are gonna have huge <laughs> impact um Hannah, do you, do you have anything else to say before we direct everybody to the website? I saw that you're, you know, you said you're making films. Is that what you do? Do you like making? Yeah, I do. So I, I graduated um, from film school last summer. Nice. Um, and that's kind of the route. So when I got told pretty much everything, there wasn't a lot I could do on the to-do list. <laughs> um, I, I still enjoyed performing. And so I, I went towards acting. Uh -huh. um, and that's when I fell in love with directing and then kind of the cheapest therapy I could find, you know, including the HBO subscription um, was watching TV and movies when I had all this free time now that I wasn't dancing or playing sports. Mm -hmm. And I fell in love with, you know, wanting to make TV shows and wanting to make films. And so um, I finally decided to bite the bullet and be like, OK, if I'm going to go to college, it's, I'm going to study something that I'm extremely passionate about. And so that's kind of where, you know, like me, but the almost 180, because I used to be really big at like politics and stuff like that. And then I was like, hey, doesn't matter what laws we make. We, again, have to change the culture. And as I'm watching all of these, you know, TV shows and movies, I'm realizing, wait, there's like nobody like me. There's no young heart patients. And the few that there are, they usually end up dying at the end of the episode. 
So there is no hope that media is telling you that you can live, be a cool person if you have a heart condition. And so yeah. that's kind of why I also went to film. Like, why, you know, why did I come here is to make films, to be able to tell stories, you know, not only like real life people's stories, like through documentaries so that, you know, writers, if they want to write a character, here you go. You have all, you know, the information that you need to write authentic representation but then being able, you know, to have a cool character that, you know, the next generation of young heart warriors, they can be like, it makes it easier to tell their friends like, hey, you know, that great binge worthy, cool, popular Netflix show, you know, that like main character. Oh, I have the same condition as him or I have the same scar. And then you're seeing as like way better. So for me, like that's one of my personal goals. And that's what we try with heart charges, you know, not only making all of this like statistics and stuff digestible for people to understand but also giving them entertainment to be able to tell our stories and to be able to bring that awareness so i'm very proud of what we've been able to tell you know mm -hmm. making a fun music video with the original yellow wiggle greg page so people knew you know how to use it and having a little kid so people know that hey even a little kid can go into sudden cardiac arrest and and bringing forth our message through that so you know, it's very much part of our goal to be able to, you know, have bigger films, yeah. bigger platforms to to be able to find, you know, the representation that we desire to be on screen so everyone can can learn and accurately learn of what it's like to live with this and how many people it actually affects. Yeah, there's definitely not enough films or documentaries about congenital heart disease and these certain diagnoses that, that arise later on in our lives. There's just not, um, there's been very few, you know, and a lot of the documentaries that have been made are like small. They, they get into maybe one or two festivals and it's all grassroots, but I'm, I, I'm a big believer that film and, you know, rallies the parents and they're the ones that push the school boards and the and and you know the people they know on the board to ask that change. So you're coming from two fronts with the politics, the filmmaking. You know, it's powerful stuff. So, um, and you've been given incredible gifts. And again, everybody go to getheartcharged.org. There's so much quality on there. Films. Um, it's just, man, it's a great website. Well done. Click on the updates to know what's happening. And, and of course your Instagram is fun. It's a lot of fun. You guys are doing <laughs> awesome things. So yeah, quickly, um, most of my audience are big believers. They love God. And, um, so I want to talk briefly and have you, before we end, just have both of you share Maybe we start with, with you, Bethany. How has having this shaped your outlook on life and your relationship with God? Um, I think it shaped my life to be able to find um, this confidence and strength that I um, was lacking for a long time um, as a child and finding like beauty and peace and again going back to that confidence and having this condition that again i didn't choose and i kid you not when hannah got diagnosed i prayed every single night on my knees like begging god please please i don't want to have this and i can tell you clear as day he told me you're gonna have this but everything's gonna be okay and I think having my defibrillator sticking out, I think it's the most beautiful, sexiest thing ever. I love it. I flaunt it. Um, but I've also learned that I can rely on God so much more and that He does listen to me. And even though sometimes I don't want to hear the answer because I feel growing up when you pray or prayer is a huge thing to me. That's the way I talk to God. That's how I feel like I feel safe. And I feel like when I was growing up, I never prayed for something so hard. And you know, you always question, am I getting the answer? Is it really happening? Is this the answer? And when I got my diagnosis, I was like, wow, he does listen to me, but everything's going to be okay. And I think I've become this stronger, confident 
um, woman. And I think along the way, God has helped me still be alive and still be able to do things. And I think every year I, I'm on a new path, but I think He has bigger goals in store for me. And I hope the dreams and the things that I want to achieve, because I'd love to see like me and you and Hannah and like all of us with um, scars and defibrillators like out in the mass media and on magazine covers and stuff. And I think God is going to open a door for all of us to be able to really show the world um, who we are and to embrace those heart conditions. Beautiful. Our scars tell our stories. There are tattoos. Yeah, that's so beautiful. Hannah, what about you? Um, yeah, I feel like, um, I don't know. I feel like I just always innately had like a strong faith in, in God. Um, but there's something for me, the biggest gift was the atoning sacrifice of, you know, God's only begotten of, yeah. of Jesus Christ and and having, you know, the scriptures of what did it mean when he suffered in Gethsemane for each and every one of us. And I think the, you know, when I first, you know, got told this, um, and it's funny, me and Bethany had similar experiences of praying and literally not being able to complete the prayers because you just, like, God's like, I, 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 I can't, like, you know, I'm almighty, but like, this is part of your journey is to have this, you know, heart condition. But I've literally felt the presence of God as I've, you know, cried in the bathroom thinking what would have happened if I didn't have my implanted defibrillator, you know. You know, not many teenagers go through that mind of thinking how, what would have happened, you know, who would have found me first, all of those things, and literally feeling like I had, you know, a shoulder to cry on when no one was there to be able to know, like, those intense pains that, you know, the doctors can't really decide like, well, hey, I have this super sharp pain. What does that mean? But knowing that there was one person who completely understands exactly what I'm feeling and to be able to give back. And, um, you know, I am LDS. I did serve a church mission. And when people would ask, you know, why are you here? Like when people would be like, oh, why are you doing this? Or, you know, I'm also in the film industry, which is not a big like Christian, you know, like thing is, like, I'm never going to deny God. Like, I think a lot of people who go through things like this that, you know, change your life. Like, I literally owe my life to God because it could have been easily the other way completely. And I could see how much he was in every step and looking out for me. The fact that I got to ignorantly play sports, knowing I had this intense heart condition and not dropping even dead before I got diagnosed. But knowing that there was people somebody bigger was watching out for me I'm always you know gonna thank him like if I ever win an Oscar and Emmy he I'm gonna thank God you know <laughs> I, I'm aware of you know my place in this but for me like I owe my life to Christ the least I could do was one go and serve him and the least I can do is make sure people don't have that intense pain and let it ease up on them and doing as Christ did is being a friend to people and I think that's the biggest thing that I think people forget like Hey, Christ is my best friend and what, you know, friendship qualities do he have that I want to give to other people and making their pain be a little bit more easier, letting them laugh, you know, with you, cry with you. We always tell people like, hey, if you ever come to the Heart Church community, like whether it's like parents or people, then they're just like, hey, girl, if you just want to go break dishes somewhere, or if you want to go cry and like eat lunch or eat cheesecake or something like let us know because we're here in any situation that you want to experience it there's no wrong feeling or no wrong response to being diagnosed with a condition or surviving sudden cardiac arrest and so i i owe him my life so the least i could do is be grateful for what i've been given doesn't mean i'm not going to cry and be angry <laughs> But, you know, I, I call it survivor's gratitude, you know, like I'm here for a reason. The least I can do is help save other people's lives. And I think that's really the underlying motivation that keeps us going when we are either being fought against or pushed back because we, you know, we're going to keep going because we're grateful to be here. And it wasn't easy for Christ. So why would it be easy for me? You know, I it, it wasn't easy and he was fighting for everything good and true. So it just takes constant fighting, but luckily I have a good support system, you know, with Bethany, with my family, with close friends, because sometimes even I get, you know, dismayed, very like, 
you know, after a while you get tired, especially like I got a lot of fatigue from this. Hard <laughs> I'm always tired. I'm always exhausted by keeping, you know, those people who have that light of Christ in your life to, uh, you know, to keep you up and keep you going to help carry that cross as you walk across fighting for people. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much. Uh, again, everybody go to heart, get heart and, um, and then of course the Instagram, which is heart charge. And, uh, yeah. Thank you. Yay. This was awesome. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. This was such an honor. This is the Paul Cardall podcast. These are those he admires and wants to share with you. Please show your support by subscribing to the Paul Cardall podcast. Cause you took my scars, bruises and broken heart, and numbed all the pain. Show me how to heal, and now I don't feel broken anymore. Number one, Billboard pianist Paul Cardall. Do you believe in miracles and second chances? Over a decade ago, I was raised from the dead. Read Paul's story, The Broken Miracle, by J.D. Netto. Visit thebrokenmiracle.com.